So uh, tonight I know I'm going to be speaking on fruitfulness because uh, that's what the theme of this event is, to be fruitful. And I was just praying about it and the Lord laid on my heart to talk to you on the laws of fruitful living. Um, one of the things you don't want to experience in your life is what we call um, fruitfulness as an event, as against fruitfulness as a lifestyle. Um, I don't want to be one person who uh, tells story of stories of last year, you know, I had a great heat, and then after that, you are in a big mess. You know, the Bible talks about the fact that there's a possibility in God that, that makes it so that you can always produce fruit. And so it doesn't matter what season. Mama, good to see you. Thank you, ma'am. So it doesn't matter what season it is, you can always produce fruit. So I want to talk to you about being fruitful. So it's not just about having fruits in the spring and then drying up in the falls and, and just disappearing in winter. <laughs> I'm talking about being fruitful at all times. Is that our desires here? Yeah. All right. We ask for the blessing on his word in Jesus' name. Yeah. Let's look at Psalms 1, verse 1 to 3. Let's remain standing so we don't sleep on the scripture. Uh, Psalms 1, verse 1 to 3. And I want us to look at the Passion's translation. Psalms 1, verse 1 to 3. The Passion's translation. And I would like, if you have the Passion's, I would, Fantastic. So I want us all to do this translation together. I know some of you don't have it. You are still King James people. That's all right. <laughs> Once in a while, just leave your King James and, and just come out of the 20th, is it 10th century. Just so. <laughs> Praise God. All right, let's do that together. One to go. Yes, he won't walk in the step. Uh-huh. Nor share in the sinner's way. Nor. Verse 2. Impassion. To the word of I am. Meditate day and night. In the true revelation of light. Verse 3. Like a flourishing tree. Planted by God's design. Deeply rooted in by the brook of bleeds, bearing fruit. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Bearing fruit how many times in a year? Bearing fruit only in spring. Bearing fruit only in 30s and disappearing at 40s. Bearing fruits only when you're in your 20s or just in your 40s, and after that, you're in trouble. Bearing fruit in every season of his life. Whatever season of life you find yourself in, there is a possibility in God that you can still be bearing fruits. Look at what follows next. He is never what? Never dry, never fainting, ever blessed, and ever what? <laughs> isn't that amazing I'm sure we can just close the whole service today you can just go home with this but there is a possibility in God for you to be never dry but there is a possibility in God for you to be one who never faints always ever blessed ever prosperous it's possible if it is not God's word, will not promise it. We ask for the blessing on this word in Jesus' name. All right, let's get down. You may be seated for a moment. Let me talk to you about some of the laws of fruitful living. How to live a productive life. In Genesis chapter 1 in verse 28, the Bible says, And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth." and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, 
and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the face of the earth. So when God blessed, the first thing that God said he wanted to see happen as a result of the blessing is that man should be what? Fruitful. Now the word fruitful is something we're going to work out here. Now it is from being fruitful that every other thing happens. In actual fact, uh, to multiply is a dimension of fruitfulness. It's a greater dimension of fruitfulness. So replenish is also a greater dimension of fruitfulness. So subdue is also a dimension of fruitfulness. So here's the point. You never have dominion until you are fruitful. No enterprise has dominion on the earth. No enterprise has marketplace dominion until that enterprise becomes fruitful in the four different expressions of fruitfulness. Coca-Cola started somewhere here in Atlanta, Georgia. Coca-Cola right now is all over the world. But it started here with a bottle. Am I talking to somebody in the house of God? Just with a bottle. Someone just started with just a little bottle of it all and, and a little bottle become, became a, a crate of it and, and before you know, it, it became what it is today and it's all over. Initially, it was here in America and before you know, it, it moved outside of the United States and then over to United Kingdom and then to Africa. Not just do we have it in Africa right now. In, in communities, some of us have never been to in Africa. In our own country, Coca-Cola is there. It is called dominance. Toyota started back in Japan. But it's in America today. It's in Canada. It's called dominance. So you never have dominion until you become fruitful. Influence is measured by spread. Influence is measured by spread. You never have influence beyond your level of spread. You, you don't have influence where you don't have spread. Do you understand that? <laughs> so God created and blessed you to be fruitful. Now, the first thing is God won't say to you be fruitful if God has not made you seedful. Can I say that again? God will never say to you be fruitful if God has not made you to be seedful. He won't place a demand on you for something you do not have the capacity to respond for. So if God says be fruitful, it means he's done his own job. He has planted seed on the inside of you. So you have a part to play. He's done his own part by putting seed on the inside of you. Please, when I talk about seed, I'm talking about your talents. I'm talking about your giftings, your abilities, your potentials. God has put that on the inside of you. Your job is to work it out. I just hope I hope you're really ready for some work today. Is that okay? Can we work it together? This <laughs> Genesis chapter 28 and verse 3, the amplified version. Genesis 28 and verse 3, the amplified version. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful. Can you see that? Can you see the connection between the blessing? And fruitfulness. He blessed them and said be fruitful. And here we are seeing a blessing here being released. And God and the prayer was made. God Almighty bless you. And the resultant effect of being blessed is that you are what? You're fruitful. That's, that's the resultant effect of being blessed. So a blessed man, a blessed woman is a fruitful person. Now put a demand on the blessing on your life. Listen, don't just say I'm blessed. Place a demand on the blessing such that the fruits begins to show. I can be blessed and not have fruits. It negates the word. It contradicts every scripture for you to say I'm blessed and I'm not fruitful. 
It contradicts the scripture. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you can become a great company of people. You can see again what I'm talking about here. You become fruitful, you multiply, you become a great company of people. That's the way it goes. What you don't expect, you don't see. If you don't expect fruitfulness, you're not going to have one. If you don't expect to see multiplication, you never see it happen. I remember when we started our prayer program, how that we were just about uh, 500 in terms of live views. We're just about 500 then. And one of the days the Lord said to me, he said, son, why haven't you accepted what I gave you? Because to be frank with you, sir, the prayer program is not something I wanted to do. You know me, I'm a leadership person. I'm, you know, I mean, I, it was difficult for me to sit on television and be praying, praying what? You don't know. I used to mock someone who used to pray online. I, I called him as a senior pastor to me and, and I called him. I said, sorry, sir, is this what midlife crisis looks like? And he called me recently. He said, Sam, you said to me I was having midlife crisis because I was praying once. He said, you are now a slave to the altar. And, 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 I, I was, and the Lord said to me, he said, son, he said, have you accepted this? And I'm like, Lord, you know, this is not what I really want to do. It's just because you say I should do it. I said, Lord, you know, this, my assignment is different. And the Lord said, so you can see that I've just given you a platform for your assignment to find expression. That was the very day I saw the connection between everything I was trying to do and what God gave to me as a platform. On that very day, I came straight to the studio and I said to the media guys, I said, guys, get what, guess what? I said, I'm ready for this work now. So within a space of two months, we went from 500 to 3,000 plus. That was the moment when Facebook had to put a lead on us because that growth was so fast that Facebook thought we were using some boats or bots or stuff like that. We're still on that matter till date. We had to get in, in, across to California. So God, so kind, some persons are helping us to walk on the inside so they can take the lead off our page. Two years now. They just couldn't beat that because every week we just saw people growing and the Lord said, because you accepted it. So when God said, when the Bible says, and the Lord God made them and blessed them and the Lord said, number one, be what? Let, let's work that out. You, this is a great house and you've heard this teaching over and over. So I just want to do a quick recap on what you've already been taught in this house. So the first thing God said is what? Be what? Be fruitful. Number two, multiply. Number three, replenish. Number four, subdue. So you don't have number four without number one. You can have, you can subdue, you can have dominion. You can subdue if you don't Become fruitful. In any aspect of life where you're not fruitful, you will never subdue. In any aspect of life. If you don't become fruitful, if you don't replenish, you don't multiply, you never subdue that aspect of life. And one of the things that I love about the word fruitful is the word para. And that word, that Hebrew word is a very powerful word. It means to produce or to become productive. So the first thing God said to us when God blessed us, is he said to us, produce. Biologically, produce. But beyond biological, God is saying in every aspect of life, I want you to be what? Productive. Produce something with what I gave you. You want to have dominion on earth, you've got to be productive. You can never become, you can never become one who has dominion in the marketplace, in any space, until you become productive. To be productive means to produce. Produce a song, produce, produce, produce clothes, produce something. 
Don't consume, produce. <laughs> help me ask your neighbor, what, what, what do you produce? Like, help me ask your neighbor, what can I buy from you? They just let me ask the person, what can I buy from you? Target.com did a research about the African-American community. And I'm sure my, my apostles must have told you that. And Target.com discovered that the African-American community is one of the largest community of consumers. Right? And it amazes you to know that what the Caucasian community produced for the African-American consu consumers, they don't consume themselves. So when it comes to the cars... The cars with the alloy rims and the rest of that with screens and they don't use that. You're the one that needs a television inside a vehicle. They did a research on hair. Who are the largest block when it comes to women? The largest spenders on hair? African American communities. Largest spenders on nails, African American communities. Cosme cosmetics, African American communities. Just name it all, African American communities. When it comes to consumption, the African American community is the top of the chain. When it comes to production, we're right at the lower rung of the, of the ladder. It just looks so natural that we, we seem to be wired to consume. And it's because most of our churches are not like your church that task your mind. So our churches don't task your mind. We just come to church and, and we just dance in the Holy Ghost and we just pray in tongues and you know we just dance in the spirit and, and when we dance in the spirit we just trust that that's going to fix all of our situation. Our finances are in a mess. We don't know the difference between assets and liabilities. We don't own real estate. We are in debt. We are in all kinds of situations because So this is a turning point. For someone here, you need to ask yourself, what do I need to produce? And, and I pray for you that you will not be able to sleep tonight until you think about something you can produce. I pray that when you're sleeping in the night, you'll be hearing my voice. What are you producing? When you have dreams, you will see me in a vision with an apostle right in the front. And we'll be telling you, what are you producing? Produce something. You need to produce something. The first, the first expression of the blessing is production. The first thing God said the blessing should make you do is to produce. The first thing the blessing does is not to make you speak in tongues. Produce something. Create a service. I was with a pastor's wife in um, London. And whilst we were talk, talking, she said to me, she said, hey, Reverend Sam, uh, because I was, I was teaching around this same subject. And she said, Reverend Sam, thank you so much for coming to do this teaching. I think I've been emboldened to pursue my vision. I said, what is it? She said, you know, in my church, she said, my husband is here, but you know, everything they talk about here is just about us being spiritual and all of that. And then when I started thinking about business, nobody's encouraging me, but thank you for coming to talk to us. And the husband sat down and was like, hey, my friend, keep quiet. And I was like, no, let her speak. And I said, ma'am, what is it that you want to talk to me about? She said, Reverend Sam, I have this vision of uh, creating products for, for women. She said, I had problem with hair loss. And one of the days, she said, I went somewhere and someone gave me something. And I got back home and I just instinctively, I just sort of mixed in it with something else. And I began to apply it to my hair and my hair began to grow. She said, then I took the same recipe. I gave it to somebody else. The person also applied it and the person's hair began to grow. To cut a long story short, as I speak with you right now, it's now a product that has been patented. They have already produced it. It now comes in a set and it's already been sold globally. Help me talk to someone and say produce, produce. 
Some of the big restaurants you have in the United States here, Kentucky Fried Chicken and the rest of them, some of them started with recipes in their homes. Am I correct? Someone just thought about it. I look, if it's sweet, I told me if we love it here, someone else will love it outside. And in order to test how wonderful it is, invite some few family friends, invite them for a dinner someday. And if everybody says, man, we love this. Anytime you hear we love this, just know that is a possibility for you to get into the marketplace. So the first expression of the blessing is to produce. Come up with a software. Solve a problem. Solve a problem. Let the preacher write a book. Let the teacher write a book. Let the singer sing songs. Produce your songs. Just something should come out of you. That's, that's what it means to produce. Something must come out of you. You must add value to humanity. The world should celebrate your birth because of your product. What will we have to your name? You came, you were born, you grew, you stayed, and then you died. So, so what? What, what did you give us? What? <laughs> what you? No, I mean, everyone asks, what are you giving to us? And I hope you do know that you never become wealthy through salary. I hope you know that salary was not designed for wealth. Yes, ma'am. The original concept of salary, actually the word salary is actually for the wages of slaves. And, and, and no employer pays you so you can become wealthy. Whatever they give to you, as much as you think it's so much, they actually give you so much so that you can be comfortable enough to keep coming back. Oh, you know, well, I make about $10,000. Well, that's how, much, that's how much they need to pay you to keep you. So it's what they give you to keep you coming back. And, and, and think about this. If he can pay you that much, imagine how much he's making through you. Is there anything wrong with working? No, but there's something wrong with working for a long time, for a lifetime. Because the whole idea is for you to work for a while, make your money, and then move into something that is yours. Move into something that is yours. Are there people that the Lord has called into civil service to work for government for the rest of their life? Let that be a calling. If that's a calling, we know that's where the Lord has called you to. So we know this is your calling. And even there... It is not just about the service you render. It's about the mission heaven wants you to carry out through that platform. So the first key to, the first key to living a fruitful life is to be productive. My wife started with, she, <laughs> she said to me uh, some years back, this is, about 22 years ago, we just got married and my wife said to me, she was like, hey, uh, can, can I get some money to start business? I'm like, no, 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 no. I have a vision. You're a caterer. So I have a vision of a big restaurant, you know, vision. And my wife looked at me, she said, come here, my friend, let's talk. <laughs> now, I'm very idealistic. My wife is very pragmatic, you know, so. And the comp the, just our coming together has really helped us. So she was like, come close. She said, um, and so wh whenever she wants to get at me, she will not call me by my name or call me baby. She will just say general overseer. She said general overseer, and, and, and you know at that time, when you call me a general overseer, the total membership of our church was just about, maybe just about 14 or 15. So you know, <laughs> so she was like general overseer. Look, your members are broke. 
you are broke. We are broke. She said, look, my friend, give me something to start business. And you too, you better go put your gift to work. On Sunday, we all meet in church. During the week, everybody go look for something else to do. And that was how I began consulting. That's how I started consulting for corporate organizations. I started consulting for government. That's how, that's how it all began. And that was when we made our decision. We said, hey, if God can be blessing us this much without having salary from the church, we made up our mind 22 years ago, we're never going to take salary from the church. And I gave her at the beginning, so you know what, I don't know, I don't know what that is in dollars now. I gave my wife 3,000 naira. Um, A thousand. Less than four dollars. Yes. Back then, when dollar was, I think, or dollar was about a hundred then. Now, just by any stretch of the imagination, it's, it's so little. But she said, put it in my hands. And I put it in her hands. And she began to make pastries. And gradually she got it enough money to start baking cake. And before you know, someone called and said, hey ma'am, can you come and do a wedding cake for us? We all did it together. So she did all the covering and all of that. I did the final design. Because this is us now. And then gradually somebody else called and said, ma'am, please, can you come? There's a bank that wants to take care of their staff. They want to train them and they need someone to provide, you know, catering services. We're like, yeah, we're available. When she told me about it, she said, but it's going to be during the week. I said, sweetheart, I have no more counseling during the week. She said, but you get people counseling for Tuesday. I said, don't worry, the Lord will take care of them. <laughs> and, and, I, and I joined her. So while she's rendering service to the people providing food, I was the one collecting the plates and washing them downstairs. And on one of such occasions, we went to render service. We were giving a lady a food, uh, we were giving her food. And she looked at me, she said, my pastor. I called her, I said, come close. I'm not your pastor here. I don't pastor me here. I said, don't any, listen. I said, call me Sam. I said, say Sam. <laughs> she said, no. I said, don't know me. You don't pay me in church. So this is where we get the pay for. <laughs> And from that little bank, we be, my wife began to render catering services to international organizations. And then all of a sudden, we got an invitation for her to come and cater for about 2,000 people. And I kept on rising. Also in my consulting work, I began to go from consulting for small organizations to big organizations, multi-million Naira organizations, and then to the government and together she was rising, I was rising. It became so much so that the lady who baked our wedding cake, who was a big time caterer, when my wife was just starting, today that lady works for my wife. When that lady saw my wife's catering equipment, she was like, what? So we don't even have space anymore. So my wife has people working for her now. I'm talking about being productive. So she's gone from, hey, can I get some money from you? To my wife telling me now, um, can you forget about taking care of family members in December? I'm going to take care of everybody. I'm saying, and I say to her, do you know how much is involved? I'm talking about in dollars, it's thousands of dollars. She's like, don't worry about that. My company will take care of it. And then, and then watch this, watch this. And then she called me, she was like, sweetheart, you have a very great gift for singles and married issues. I'm like, yeah. She was like, why don't you go and do conferences for singles? I'm like, it's, it's about sustaining the payment for the hall. She's like, okay, would you promise me you'll take care of singles? I will take care of paying for the halls. I'm like, really? You know, when you have a wife like that, then you say to her, now I know that God led me correctly. See, the point 
which I'm making is become productive. You never have an idea what the little in your hand can become until you are consistent with it. Start. I've taught this and I've seen millionaires evolve in our church. Just the simple teaching. I've seen young men who were nothing. I've seen God raise them up and began to bless them. Your wealth is in your productivity. I've got 27 minutes, so let me quickly run. I have a lot to share with you today. So the first thing the Lord said to them is be fruitful. And the word fruitful there means to produce or become productive. And it means to convert intangible ideas, concepts, solutions, convert them, skill sets and talents into tangible fruits. Because what the man does for a man to become productive, all he does is to pull out a seed that is on the inside of him which is not so tangible. He gives it to his wife and then she in return also become productive and then here we are today. I am Samuel because my father gave my mother a seed and my mother took care of the seed and here we are today. Amen. It's about being able to take the tang intangible seed that nobody sees. Your talent, your gift, your ability to speak, your ability to write. We were in London uh, last year or early this year, I think, and, and, and I, there were some women I said to them, I said, look, why don't you think of doing something with yourself? And I looked at a woman, I said to her, I said, ma'am, why don't you write? And the woman took my word seriously, went to sit down and put a book together. And then I came back to London barely two months after, or three months after, and she said, Reverend Sam, this is the book. I'm like, what? She said, when you spoke to me, I went to sit down and I put the book together. Few weeks after I blessed the book, she called me. She said, Reverend Sam, guess what God is doing? She says, I speak with you right now. The United Kingdom has adopted the book as a book to be used in all the schools. She said, right now I have to resign my job because I'm going to be traveling across the United Kingdom. Produce. 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 Pastor Sam, is there any hope for someone like me at my age? There's something you know. There's something you've been through in this life that younger girls will wish they know how to overcome what, what you overcame. They are struggling with. If you can put that in little books, you'll be shocked what that will do. Produce. Seeds don't always look much until you put them in the ground. You never know what a song can become until you release it. You never know what a book can do until you let it go. You never know what an idea can become until you put it out. <laughs> Number two, multiply. Multiply. To multiply is a Hebrew word, rabat. R-A-B-A-H. And, and the word Rabah means, please don't miss this now. It simply means make more of what you've already produced. Make more of it. Make more. Let more people have access to it. Make more. So, so here's the game. There are so many who have produced but they are not prosperous. You know why? They've not created so much of what they produce for more people to have access to it. So your real fruitful, fruitfulness begins when you begin to make more of what you've created. Put it another way, when you begin to let more people have access to what you've already produced. So it's not the issue of production. It might just be the issue of consumption. How many people have access to what you produce? No doubt your product is great. Listen to me. It is not the greatest products that are celebrated. It is the known products that are celebrated. The sad part of it is that those who have original products, those who have authentic products, the problem is that they don't push it out for so many people to get to consume it. 
So here's what I want to challenge you to do. Once you produce something that you know is of value, why don't you begin to make sure you find a way to let more people to have access to it. Multiply. Multiply the consumption of it. Multiply access to it. Multiply those who use it. This is your assignment. This is not God's assignment. When God says multiply, he's saying you have a responsibility to make that happen. So yes, you've written the book, but is it on Amazon? We're talking about multiplication here. And that takes us to number three, which is to replenish. When it comes to replenishment, we're talking about, there's a Hebrew word for that, they call it male, M-A-L-E. It's almost like male, okay? Now, the word male in the Hebrew simply means, so uh, when it says replenish, it simply means distribute it. Now, this is not just about me saying to people, come and have access to what I have. Come, come see what I have. Come have access to what I have. It's not about me saying, come see. It's not about me saying, come have. All right? It's about me saying there are many who will never come, so I take it to them. All right? So when you are fruitful, we say that you are, you are productive. You produce. So fruitfulness is about production. Multiplication is about mass production. Replenishment is about distribution. In being fruitful, you make something. In multiplying, you make more of what you've made. In replenishment, you make many to get to see what you've created. Now, this is where you take advantage of strategic platforms that will get many who desire what you've created to see and to taste what you've created. You may have to go to events. You may... Let me, let me say this. When you are not on demand, stop placing demands. When you are not on demand, just know it. You are not yet on demand. So wisdom requires that you are able to say, listen to me. People don't know my product yet, but I know what I have. So I'm going to go to them for now. I'm going to give it to them. Hey, sir, you need to taste this. Ma'am, you need to taste this. And then when I get you to taste it, the next thing you're going to come after me. When you are not on demand, don't be ashamed to reach out to people. We have a couple in Canada. And I'm sure those who join us in the prayer will remember last year, uh, we were having a Zoom prophetic service and, and I pointed at this couple and I said, the Lord began to give me word concerning their business. I said, what you guys do? And the guy said he produces uh, uh, this, like, you know, Texas kind of cap and all of hats and stuff like that. And the Lord began to say to me, I said, where do you operate from? He said, they're operating from the basement of their house. And I said, no, the Lord is showing me you're going outside of the basement of your house. I see you in a mall. F few months later, sir, they sent us a picture they were at the mall. And just barely a few weeks ago, there was a major event in Canada. And they said to me, they said, Pastor Sam, guess what? We are not just in the mall we were in before. We've also gotten another place. And this time around, we are at a major event taking place in Canada. And they said, sir, we are recording sales we've never had. And all of this happened within a year. Meanwhile, they've been in the basement of their house for years. They are productive, but they are not replenishing. Their distribution potential is very low. God has blessed us with an apostle, no doubt, in this house. And every Sunday, he brings us the kind of word that changes our lives. That's why many of us are seeing here for years. But here's one thing our church must do well now. We must make sure that the word that is being produced here is mass produced and distributed. Otherwise, the word that can save the city will die in this location. Jesus.
Jesus did not take the gospel to the nation. Jesus didn't take the gospel to the nations. His disciples, you and I, are the ones who take the message of our master to the nations. If the city is not hearing the message from your pastor, it is a failure of the leadership. The leadership is failing. Whosoever is in charge, sir, thank God for people like you, sir, you're in the house. Whosoever is in charge of the entire leadership should whip the leadership together. Say, so listen, how do we get the oil in this house out of the house? We have no idea what the oil in this house can do to this city until, listen, until we get it out of this house. So it's, 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 it's about all saying, listen to me, I, I take the responsibility. The head of the men's fellowship, the head of the women's fellowship, if there's a teaching our pastor has done uh, concerning men and all of that, we want to find a way to package it and we want to go around to the community and say, hey, sorry, have you got, we just want to give you a gift and all of that. It's about distribution. The most powerful churches on earth are not the ones with the most powerful preachers, but they are the ones with the most powerful distribution channels. I know you may not have seen me coming in this direction. <laughs> Here we had a situation, ma'am. We had a situation where the Bible said there was this woman who was crying to Elisha, oh, man of God, you know, my husband, my husband is about dead and, you know, and he left us in debt and all the story. And, and Elisha said, ma'am, come here. What, what you have in the house? She's like, nothing. You, you, you know, you know the danger of being, the danger of becoming so used to the oil you have. The danger of becoming so used to the oil you have in your house. He said to her, what you have in the house? She said, nothing. Is it not, uh, is our pastor's message? That's all we have in the house. In fact, she did not even say uh, my pastor's man. She says, nothing save a pot of oil. And the man of God said to her, you know the reason why that oil in the house has never profited you in the house? Oh, get me right. You need to hear me. Do you know why the oil in your house has never profited all of you in the house? Because you've never found a way to take the oil, put it in consumable format, and take it to the community. When the community begins to taste the oil that you have in your house, that is where many of your ministries will begin to find expression. Because when people begin to patronize your church, you will become busy with so many new women to take care of. You will have men to take care of. You will have young girls to take care of. But none of your ministries will find expression until you send your oil out. My pastors have never been so busy like we are today. Listen, it's the same oil we had in our house for 20 years. But in the last two years, boom. Because some people, be, I, I wasn't the one sharing. I didn't even know anything about sharing. So I noticed there was a guy who, when, when, I, when we're online, there's this guy who always say, please share, share. I'm like, what is this? What's all this sharing about? I didn't know. And then I noticed some of my pastors took it upon my leaders. They took one of my women. She took it upon herself. They would just share and share. And then people began to testify. I got to watch the broadcast. I watch it in this place. I watch it in that place. And I did not bring it to Jackie's here. I did not bring it to Jackie in Atlanta here. How did Jackie get to watch the broadcast? She's here in Atlanta. How did Dr. Kalu get to see it? How did they get to see it? I did not share. Someone believed in the oil I had and thought about it. That look, you know what? I think I need to send it to someone somewhere in the Caribbean, someone in the Bahamas. 
Did I see Alice in the house? Look at that. Alice, Alice came all the way from um, Antigua. And Alice, when she left here, the first time she came to worship here, she was like, Reverend Sam, Apostle Benny is such an amazing, is, that was what you just said to me. That is from Antigua. Someone coming to your house and like, what? You have such a man here. You have such a message in this house. People in Antigua don't know about it. I am in Africa. People in Antigua know about it. It is not a problem with the production. It is not a problem with the mass production. Because for over 26 years, there's enough message in the house. The problem is with the distribution. Old oil never prom profits those who are in the house. No, 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 no. Old oil profits those who are outside the house. What you consider to be a well that's pastors. When was the last time you listened to one of the... Some of you don't listen to pastor's message more than when you heard it in church. But that message, if you listen to it again, it will change your life. If you take that message and create a distribution channel and say, look, listen to me, we're going to find a way somebody here amongst the leadership must take the responsibility to ensure every team, every department, every, every group must get involved in distribution. And why am I asking you to distribute? When you begin to distribute, then people begin to hear. People begin to come. And as people begin to come, the house begins to grow. And as the house begins to grow, everybody then has an assignment to carry out. So now all my pastors are busy. Like Pastor Sam, we can't sleep again. I'm like, you can't what? They say, Pastor, people are calling us midnight. I say, welcome to the new world. It's what it is. Because the whole thing has been shared. Distribution. You are excellent in your service. You have an excellent work culture. The only challenge is that people don't know. Imagine what will happen if you create more awareness. Imagine what will happen. You have no idea who will see and patronize you and how that can change your life. I was here that I, I was here some times ago when we had the um, the um, the person in charge of the Bahamas, the embassy of the Bahamas. He came to the church here. The, yes, sir. He was here some times ago. And we met. And I think it, we chatted at some times. And I was like, oh, maybe I will go to the Bahamas this time around. But I just, I just had a withdrawal on the inside of me. And at the fullness of time, I didn't go to the Bahamas. The Bahamas came to me. From my little corner in Africa, the oil was sent to the Bahamas. How it got to the Bahamas, I don't know. Who sent it to the Bahamas, I don't know. And now the Bahamas is turned 50 years old. And I just got a call from two women who join us, who are doing very well in government. And they were like, Reverend Sam, we'd like to ask you to come over to the Bahamas for the prophetic prayer conference. And I'm like, sorry, man, it involves the Lord. They were like, just give us a date and leave the rest to us. So I have nothing to do with anything they are doing over there, venue, payment, all of that. They just say, just tell us you're coming. All of that would have died in Africa if it wasn't distributed. You don't know how incredibly blessed you are until you begin to let out what you have in the house. Trapped potentials never pro profit the one who traps them. You never know how much, how, how much you can create 
by letting out magmas from the rock or from beneath the rock. When a volcanic eruption takes place and the lava flows out, it creates new layers of rocks. But trapped within the rock, it's liquid. Outside of the rock, it creates new rocks. You never know what you can create if you release what is on the inside of you until you release what is on the inside of you. <laughs> this is how to be fruitful in life. Imagine what the world will look like without Facebook. Imagine what the world will look like without, without Google and the rest. These were all potentials trapped in human beings. But they pushed them out. And look at what it has become today. Look at what the iPads and Apple and all of that. Look at what they've become today in our lives. Our lives are totally, totally changed by these products. Because someone will not let what he carries on the inside die on the inside. And when the person produced it, he made up his mind, we will distribute it to the far ends of the earth. So they open up offices in different countries of the world for distribution purposes. Every time I talk like this, I... I feel so passionate for the church. Because I just see people come to church Sunday after Sunday. And that's just all we have. And just live on meager income. And just barely surviving. And, and comfortable with that. And struggling with our bills. And trusting Jesus to do for us what he has enabled us to do for ourselves. I may never come to see what we're, what we're destined to be. Yes, of course, tomorrow, uh, people like prayer. So we're going to be praying tomorrow. But let me tell you this. As wonderful as praying is, this is, a, this is the kind of meeting I love the most. That you're able to get up and you're able to do something. Number one, produce. Number two, mass produce. Number three, distribute it. Get it to someone. Let someone, let someone have a feel of it. Some of you must have seen Pastor William McDowell wearing some of our African outfit lately. I called one of my young men. I said, look, you know what? I said, when I go to America now, they don't like me to use their suits, so I get to dress American. I said, I also want them to start dressing Nigerian. <laughs> so I, I brought this nice material. I said, can you do me something that Pastor William, we got Pastor William's measurement, and I took this stuff. I'm all right, Pastor Sam. I love it. I'm like, really? Oh, that's cool. And then I brought him again, and then stayed some time. And he said, Pastor Sam, can I get the website of that guy? And he started buying himself. How much is it? I said, last year, sir, he was buying each of it for about 200 and something dollars. Convert that to Nigerian money, that's a lot. It's gone from Pastor William now to Bishop Jakes, Pastor Anna. Yes. The young man I'm talking about now so makes dresses for presidents. They send private jets. He's in our church. There's one of our members here now. They sent private jets to come pick him up from Nigeria to travel to an African country to just go get a president's measurement. Private jet. I said, Lord, why didn't I see this vision before? I'm like, God, this is something. Just like, bring me a private jet just to go take measurement. Like, like I just come now, like, okay, sir, you stay here. Okay. All right, thank you, sir. When was it? Okay, no, pilot, take him back. Like, that's, that's it. 
And once he's ready again, they send a private jet to come pick him up. And then he takes the dresses to the president. And they look at it. And then this president introduces him to another president. So that young man who started few years ago, just about 10 years ago, now has sent us across Africa. He's opened somewhere here in the United States. Opened another place in Europe. As I speak with you, he's getting ready to come from China. He's been in China for about a month. He's about to bring in some new set of dresses into Africa like we've not seen before. It started so small. His wife needed to have a baby here in, in the United States. He paid. Do you know how much it costs for us to have babies? Do you know how much we pay to come here? He paid the money up front with ease. Came here, got a comfortable apartment for his wife. Had their baby, told her to relax. Everything they needed was paid for. After the whole stuff, he said, do you still have anything I can pay for? They said, no, everything is paid for. Kept his wife, took care of her, flew her back into the country at an appropriate, appropriate time. He said, Pastor, I saw a lot of Americans who were in need and I, I never knew people were in need there. He said, I gave them money. Way back in Africa, making so much money. Selling clothes to people right here. One of the young men who makes hair for me, his name is Hef Baba, Hef, Hef, Hef Ephraim. He owns Hef Babas in London. Hef called me. He follows us too. Hef called me and he says, I need to talk with you. I say, yes, what's going on? He says, I started a barbing salon just for men. And he said, right where I started from, God began to bless the work of my hands. And Hollywood began to call him. So whenever they have like a production movie stuff to do and they want to do some crazy hair, he is the barber on set. He tis, if they're going to be there for one month, he's there for one month, so he's on contract. He said, sir, they send private jet to come and pick me from London to California. He's, God so blessed them he called me recently. He says, I want to come home. I want to come to Nigeria. I said, what's going on? He says, I, I'm coming to see you. And he came straight to me and he said, sir, I want to buy properties in Nigeria. I said, Hef, you want to do what? He says, I want to buy properties. Where will you encourage me to buy properties? I said, from fixing, cutting hair. I said, Lord, maybe I should go into this too. <laughs> My question is, how is it that Hollywood will fly across the United States to the United Kingdom, pick up a young man there, they call him a celebrity barber now, pick up a young man, fly him to California, cut hair for some people and fly him back? What do you have in your hands? I shared with you several years back, some years back. I say, anytime God wants to prosper you, there are four places, four areas God will use to prosper you. What's in your hand? What's in your head? What's in your heart? What's in your house? You want to prosper? At any time, if you find yourself in a financial mess and you want to come out of it, number one, Look at your hand. There's something you can do with your hands that can change your life. A book you can write, care you can provide, something you can bake, something you can make, something you can create, something you can produce. There's something your hands can do. And listen to what the Bible says. I will put rain upon the works of your hands. Your hands. Number two, your head. Ideas, ideas. Never play with the ideas that stream through your mind. They can change your life. If you dwell on the ideas and convert them into tangible use, these ideas can change your life. The problem with most of us is that we're too lazy to process thoughts.
We, we, we're not patient. In, oh man. Rather than, the idea just came, oh my God. You can sit down to process the thought, rather you just Netflix. So you're consuming. You're not writing scripts for the movie producer. You're not. You've watched so many movies, you've written no script. It would have been so wise if with all the movies you've watched, you have become an actress. That would have been a reward for all the movies you've watched. You didn't write scripts. You don't produce any movie. You don't not just consume it. So check your hands. What can you do? Your head, ideas, your heart, passion. What are you passionate about? Never play with your passion. It can change your life. Your passion for kids, your passion for children, your passion for the elderly. I was in Larch in Syracuse, a home for the elderly. I'm sure, anybody know Larch here? You need to get there and see what God is doing there. It started with someone. I was in, uh, um, what you call this now, Nebraska, in Omaha. I was in a home there. Now, it started with a couple who just had a burden because of what was going on in Nebraska, because of the old people, people who are always hanging out on the street. And so a family just said, look, you know what? There's a passion in our heart. Can we help the people here? And they decided to, to get a three-bedroom flat. And they decided to bring the old people there and started caring for them. From the three-bedroom, it moved to a big apartment. And from there, today, they are government-funded and they still remain faith-based. Today, the government has a home for veterans. If you get there, their dining hall is twice this hall. They have homes for women. I'm talking about buildings for women, buildings for men, buildings for veterans. It's, it's, it's a massive place, but it started with just a couple who had a passion for something. Engaging your mind in productive thinking is the key to productivity in life. You can't pray in the spirit and ignore your mind. God didn't tell you to remove your mind. He said renew your mind. It is dangerous for you to be a Christian who doesn't put your mind to work. He said, Let, he said be it transformed by the renewing, not the removing of your mind. When was the last time you engaged your mind in productive thinking? When was the last time, rather than just pray through, you thought through? Some of our life's challenges will be dealt with if you will sit down, which is what you don't like, you will sit down and put off the light and engage your mind in serious thinking process. And, and listen to me, I'm not saying don't pray. If you want to pray this out to pray, Lord, show me the way. Lord, show me the way. Lord, help me to come out of this. Lord, show me the way. Lord, how do I come out of this? Lord, show me the way. Lord, show me the way. Lord, Lord, let my mind move to higher dimensions of thoughts. Let my mind go beyond the limiting realms of this life. Let my mind move into dimension beyond human comprehension. Let me begin to fellowship with higher thoughts. That's what we do. You can't be stranded. How, how, how can you say you're stranded? How can you be stranded? You have the spirit of God. You have the word of God. You have a mind that is supposed to be renewed by the word. And you are stranded. No. Lord, I have bills to pay. I don't know how to get the money out. Lord, let my mind begin to work. Okay, so what do I do, Lord? What do I do? You engage your mind in productive thinking. If you can think through, you will break through. Yeah. 
I needed to raise some money. Some years back, my wife and I needed to raise some money. And, and very early, I was taught, I was taught as a pastor that there are about three to four different ways by which pastors make their money. All right? Number one is through empowerment. People you empower, you pour yourself into them. Over time, God raises them up. They turn back, few of them, not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> So you pour into people, you empower them. Now that is a long time investment. So you pour yourself into those people. Over time, they grow up, become very, very, very successful and they turn back to bless you. Now, how long are you going to wait? All right. So number two is for a pastor to have partners. All right. So we have people like Jesus in his ministry days in Luke chapter eight. The Bible said there were certain women, women, who were blessed. The ministry of Jesus had blessed their lives. And the Bible said this woman, Jesus did not put them together. This woman came together. You call, you call her and then you the woman call and say, hey come, you know what? Apostle Ben has been a blessing to us. His ministry has changed our lives. You only need to be under a wrong pastor for your life to be turned in a different direction. Just a wrong teaching can mess up your life. Look, this man's ministry has helped us. Our marriages are okay. Our families are okay. So the women called themselves together and they said, look, how can we minister to Jesus of our substance? Meaning, we go to work, God blesses us, we bless him. That's like partnership. Number three is for a pastor to actually be raising offering. Every service. Now, the members will get tired. Or when the members know that he has preached and he's getting close to that moment, then people will start going out to use the restroom. <laughs> the other side of it is for the pastor to become productive and turn his teachings into materials that can be consumed. Like books, CDs, so we started very early. We didn't have recording facilities. So we go to another church called Family Worship in Abuja. We go to Family Worship and my wife and I will sit down there for them to help us mass produce our own messages at the level at which they were producing. So we started with excellence when we couldn't afford it by leveraging relationships. After a while, we're able to buy the duplicating machine ourselves. And gradually, we began to do it ourselves. And through prudence, God began to help us. We bought more machines. And then one day, my wife called me. She said, look, you like editing for people. Why don't you do your own book? And I'm like, wait a minute, that's true. And, I, and she said to me, you know what? I'm giving you the next three months to produce a book. And I've arranged a table there. You got to sit down there and write that book. I'm like, really? She said, yes. She said, nobody's going to distract you. Nobody. And I sat on, those, on that table, sir. In three months, I never knew what was inside me. In three months, I came out with three books. Every one of those books, every time we write, we produce them, we, we bring them out, they sell out. Those were the first book in their thousands that put money in our hands. Those were the books that brought me to the United States first. After the U.S. government, before the U.S. government brought me. Sorry, after the U.S. government brought me. For ministerial engagement, that was the first set of books. Somebody read my book somewhere in, in, in Texas. I said, no, I need, to, I need to have this man. Someone listened to my message in London and said, no, 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 I need to have this man. I'm talking to people with trapped oils. You are suffering unnecessarily. You have what can take care of the rest of your life if only you will look inwards. You've, God never leaves you without the oil that will change your life. The only challenge is you've ignored it for too long. You value the oil of others because they process theirs 
You ignore yours and that's why you're constantly envying them. If you will get to walk on your own oil, after a while somebody else will be envying you too. I've not started talking to you about the loss. I'm supposed to share 11 laws with you. We're still in the introductions. So I guess I'm going to do that on Sunday. So get ready for a really serious time on Sunday. I'm going to task you. <laughs> so four, four foundational principles for, for living a fruitful life and a productive and, and very fulfilling life. Number one, is to do what? Can I hear everybody? Say it again loud and clear. Say it again. Now I want you to personalize. I say I will produce. I want you to become responsible. Say I will produce. Alright? So the first thing he said to them, be fruitful. And the word fruitful there means para. It means to be fruitful. It means to produce. To be productive. So turn the seed of talents and abilities and potentials and skills. Turn them into consumable products, services that human beings can take and pay you for. Number two, don't just produce, do what? Multiply. multiply. And to multiply means what? Mass produce. Make more of what you have started producing that is of value. Make more of it. Now let me say this. The most, the most significant season in the life of anyone that is going to be very successful is the season of mass production. Because that's a season where you're making more. You're making more. You're making more. It, it's a lot of work. To so make more of what you've created that is of great value. Number three is to replenish. And what does replenishment mean? Distribute. Distribute. Make sure you find platforms that will enable you to get across to the people who need what you carry. Find a way to connect with those who need you. You didn't hear what I just said. Walk away from everyone who ignores you. It's important for you to know everyone won't need you. Stop trying to please everybody. We've got seven, over seven billion people on earth. If one person wants to make you feel like you are nothing, walk away from the person, share the grace. Just tell the person ashes to ashes, dust to dust. God be with you till we meet again. Turn your eyes away from the person. Somewhere next door, someone will see you as a Messiah. Jesus said, I came to my own and my own received me not. And when Jesus turned to the Gentiles, the entire Gentile nation is celebrating him. Why waste your try time trying to convince people whose minds are made up concerning you? You're trying to explain yourself to a people who will never, never accept your explanation. Their minds are made up. For whatever reason, you just don't fit in. So don't try to force it. Why did God give you legs? Say, <laughs> what, what do you do? And if I come to you, sir, love you, man. If I come to you, I know you love me, so I'm not. <laughs> if I come, you don't, look, I, I walk away. I'm not the first to walk away. He came to his own and his own received them not and he. It's as simple as that. Distribute. Someone needs your product. Are you Dabi said, he said, when I began to sell insurance, he said, the first doors I knocked on, everybody told me no. He said, but I kept on knocking. And one of the doors that opened up, he said, that was the door that changed my life around. He said, always knock. The first 10 doors may say no. The last one that will say yes will pay you for the ones that said no. Keep at it. A man was online and was doing a program and just maybe just about a hundred and something people were watching him. And the man felt so bad with all this kind of stuff that I have. I mean, you know, and just few number of people. 
And then a day or so after I got a phone call, hello, hi, how are you doing? And he said, fine. Um, my name is Oprah Winfrey. What? How'd you get my number? Well, you displayed your number. She said, I was among those who watched what you did yesterday. Here was the man feeling so down and out because of just how many people. Didn't, he didn't know that his kind of program is not for the mass. The masses. It's not for multitude because his thought pattern is such that it is only for people who are cerebral. So the kind of people that fall into that class are not many. And Oprah was one of them. She said, you know what? I'd like you to come over to my studio because Oprah Winfrey Network now will begin to send your program to the nations. That was it. That was a turning point. Keep at it. Keep distributing. Have you heard about my product? Don't be ashamed. Never create a product you are unwilling to market. Never produce anything that you are unwilling to sell yourself. Dad, if I tell you, I will sit down after prophetic prayer in the morning, I will sit down. I'm attending to phone calls. I'm, I'm sending messages. I mean, literally anybody that sends me a message will tell you that by some response. I will send messages. I will respond to emails. I'll send response to this. In the early days, I will do everything by myself. Because if I believe in this, I'm the best person to promote it. I was flying in from London just about a month ago. I, a friend of mine was having a conference there in London. And I had gone to all my friends' conferences. Just I leave Nigeria on a Friday. I get into the conference on Saturday. From the conference, I get back on Saturday. I get into the plane again, fly back into Nigeria, and I get into the service Sunday morning. So 24 hours trip. I did that back to back with my friends. And on the last trip, I was like, must I do this? And the Lord said, do it. And on my way back, we were flying into Nigeria, and I heard a whisper in my spirit, get the Wi-Fi on. And I got the Wi-Fi activated in the plane, and I just saw a message came in. Hello, Reverend Sam. This is X, Y, and Z from Daystar Television. We were checking on prayer platforms in Africa, and we stumbled on yours. And we just want to let you know that yours fits our philosophy. Would you please do a five minutes video chronicling everything God has used your program to do in over 1,000 days? I said, why not? Immediately I got down, we went straight to work, sent it to them. In mass production time, you work, you work. And we sent it to them. Barely a few days after they, they broadcasted, they called me and said, Reverend Sam, something is going on here. That one of the leading men of God in Minnesota saw your program and said, look, we should make sure we bring you to him. And then he said, sir, Daystar has decided by the leading of God to partner with your program to broadcast it to the nations. That number, number three, we'd like you to come over to Dallas. He just sent me a message today. I know you're in America. When are you coming over to Dallas? That we'd like you to come and do a live program the way you do it in your, on your stage. We'd like you to come do it on Daystar. First time it will be happening to an African on Daystar. What am I saying? What am I saying? What am I saying? Must produce and distribute. You never tell, you never can tell who will stumble on your product. Just keep at it. Consistency, persistence. My time is up. Let me respect myself. Thank you.